I'd actually like to start this off by making a request of you all. Raise your hand if you've ever tried to tell someone about something that happened to you and they didn't believe you. And I want us to consider how we felt when we found someone that did. I suspect that it made us feel relieved, grateful, and understood. As we grow up, we long for loving, fulfilling relationships with those we admire. And when we don't receive those things, it could be detrimental to both our growth and development. For children, this is crucial, especially if abuse is introduced into a child's life. Children who are abused often have trouble forming and maintaining relationships, participating in activities they may normally enjoy, and are even at further risk of being victimized later in life. In these circumstances, getting outside help is the best course of action, and that starts with believing the victims. When I was a child, all I ever wanted was to be believed. I grew up in a broken home, saddled with bruises, mental scars, and grief over a mother that never was. My name is Sylvia Rodriguez, an artist, activist, advocate, and future educator and also a survivor of child abuse. And this is my story. I grew up in an impoverished household, living with a single mother, living in various small apartments that I managed to share with many siblings. Now, I say various small apartments because we moved around a lot. I was hardly able to keep any friends because I would be gone the next year. And I was the weird new kid everywhere I went. And that came with its fair share of bullies. But my biggest bully was right at home. My biggest bully was my mother. My mother would find any reason, anything, to abuse me for almost every day. A broken glass, my room not being cleaned to satisfaction, an A instead of an A plus on a report card. Anything to justify her taking out her frustrations in life on me. And she reminded me that anything that she had gone through justified that. Her words still ring incessantly in my head. I had it worse when I was your age gaslighting me and much of my family into believing what she was doing was normal. My relatives often tried to reason with her, but to no avail. Using that same analogy, she silenced them, and my abuse was hidden behind closed doors. (sighs) She drilled into my head that nobody would ever believe me, and to never tell a soul about what happened in that house. So, I didn't. I became a nervous, anxious, and reserved child, trapped in a carefully crafted mental and physical prison of my mother's design. I had drawn for as long as I could remember And for many children, art is an activity of exploration, of joy. But for me, it was a coping mechanism, a mental escape. I often drew myself as a monster, a spawn of the devil. But the only monster in my life was her. I hardly ever left my room except to go to school. And when I did go to school, I made sure to hide my bruises. I had a hard time making friends because I didn't trust anyone. And that made it incredibly difficult to bond with my peers and teachers on top of my mother's strict rules. 
Rarely was I allowed to go to sleepovers. And I didn't really enjoy them because I thought every other child was going through what I was. My mother always feigned normalcy around strangers, pretending that our family was just as average as any other. And I merely thought other parents did the same. I slipped up once, and someone did see my injuries. And authorities did get involved, but my mother simply lied her way out of it, cementing in me that Nobody believed me. Days seemed to get more miserable after that. Until eventually, my family settled down in a small town in Massachusetts, and I was accepted into a vocational high school to learn how to paint. Everything seemed tolerable for a while. I had a job so I can get my own clothing and necessities. I went to clubs and sports after school, so I could avoid going home. I was a high honor roll student. I was making some real friends. And I was finally big enough where my mother was too intimidated to hurt me anymore. Everything seemed to be looking up until my mother allowed a horrible man to enter our home and chose him over me. After one last senseless argument. She kicked me out to fend for myself when I was just 16 years old. I remained homeless for the majority of my junior and senior years of high school, moving from place to place until I ended up living with my grandfather, who lived just outside of my school's district. This meant the bus would no longer be able to take me to and from school every day. And this was devastating. I didn't have a license, and my grandfather could never wake up so early as to take me to and from school each morning. I was backed into a corner, faced with a lack of resources and the prospect of having to drop out my senior year. I finally decided to say something. I finally decided to tell my teachers what my mother was doing to me. And they believed me. For the first time in my life, I was able to get the help I so desperately needed. My teachers made sure that I had food and necessities and got me a personal bus that would take me to and from school every day. They gave me the emotional support I needed to push through my last year of school. For the rest of my senior year, I worked my absolute hardest, and I became the very first person in my biological family to graduate from high school. I was accepted into one of the best art schools in the country. No, in the world. Rhode Island School of Design, RISD. And during all of this, I fell in love. I told my story and I was taken in by a wonderful woman who made sure I had a place to study and I would never have to worry about finding another place to sleep again. She would adopt me and make me a permanent part of her family. At RISD, I studied art as a voice for social justice, and I subsequently graduated, getting my bachelor's in fine arts as a first-generation student. I majored in illustration and had a concentration in theory and history of art and design. And I couldn't have done it without the help of my adoptive family, close relatives, and teachers. My journey inspired me to pursue advocacy through my art. And I studied to become a children's book illustrator and writer to help amplify the voices of children who came from marginalized backgrounds, just like me. I wrote and illustrated the book closest to my heart, A Mother's Love, a metaphor for my finding and fighting for having the wonderful mother figure in my life I'm happy to call my mom. I hope that book gets published one day. 
But I didn't stop there. I wanted to become an advocate for children in my community. So, right after graduating from RISD, I returned to pursue my master's in arts and teaching, not only to become an art teacher that shows my students the beauty of the world around us, but to also be there should any of my students need the same kind of help I did, just like my teachers did for me. I graduated high school, graduated college, went to grad school, became an advocate and activist because I had believers in my life who chose to believe my story. I'm able to pursue the life I want, the dreams I want to pursue because I had people who were there for me who cared enough to do something. Now, with the help of these believers, that chapter of my life is over. But for lots of children around the world and in the United States, abuse is a nightmare that they're living through every single day. These children are raised to be hopeless, afraid of the consequences of letting people know what is happening to them. This can mean someone reporting back to their parents and getting them hurt worse. Maybe them being kicked out onto the street with no support system or safety net, or even further victimization at the hands of someone else. These children are raised to be silent, and that's why it's important that we listen when they dare say something. The most important thing I want you all to consider today, know that I ask of you, is to be a believer for this child. To listen to these children when they come for you for help. Never tell them to be silent. Show them as much empathy and care as you can. And if you don't have a capacity to be that resource, find someone or somewhere that will. In some cases, you might be the only person that child feels comfortable going to. Look out for those children who seem a little too afraid to talk about their home lives. Children who seem a little too withdrawn from their peers. And even those children who seem just a bit too clingy. Because for them, you might be their only source of positive attention. My relatives, my peers, and my teachers were my only sources of that kind of attention. And for those of us who have lived through it and are living through it today, know that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. I promise. I'm here with you all, standing here today, healing and happy because I had people in my life to be that light for me. Together, we can create a platform for victims of abuse and elevate the voices of the silenced. Thank you.